communication with Chairman Sanjay Joshi at the Observer Research Foundation. Mr. Joshi, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to have uh, Minister Lavrov here with us today again at Raisina. Uh, so time is short, so we'll cut quickly to the chase. Uh, and I'm asking this question as someone from India. Uh, in India, often we say that, you know, we live in a very troubled neighborhood. We do not choose the friends and allies our partners make, our, our neighbors make. You do not choose? We do not choose. The, the sound is not very clear. You do not choose. No country has a choice of what friends or allies its neighbor is going to make. And they can be sometimes uncomfortable allies and friends. But we don't go to war over it. Now, what is it that leads Russia into this long protracted war about NATO expansion? Well, I, I, I assume that the people who assembled here, uh, they are political scientists. They are interested in following the international developments. And uh, if this is the case, then for the last 20-some <coughs> years, uh, they should have understood uh, the reasons uh, why we are concerned about the Western policy towards Russia uh, very well. Uh, yesterday, I think, the French ambassador to Israel, who was personally participating in the discussions with, uh, between the Western leaders and Gorbachev, he confirmed that there was a commitment not to expand NATO. And then he added, but this does not mean that Russia is right uh, in what it is doing in Ukraine. But between the lie about not expanding NATO and the events which started one year ago, uh, there were so many developments which you cannot overlook. The uh, lies continued, uh, in, uh, including the, the lies not about some oral promises, but about some commitments on paper. In OSC, Organization of Security and the Cooperation in Europe, uh, during a summit in Istanbul in 1999. Uh, the political declaration was signed by the presidents and the prime ministers, which said security is indivisible and the OSC participants are all committed to equal and indivisible security. Then they stated that each country uh, is free to choose alliances, but in doing so, no country can strive to strengthen its security at the expense of the security of others. And then another principle was signed by the presidents and the prime ministers, uh, according to which no country and no organization in the OSC region can pretend to dominate militarily. If you, if you uh, read it again, it's clear that NATO violated uh, all these commitments. By the way, it was 1999, and then it was repeated in 2010 at another OSC summit in, in uh, Kazakhstan. And when we started to ask questions, guys, you committed yourself not to increase your security at the expense of our security. Uh, can you stop expanding NATO? They said, well, this is just political commitment. But, Minister, what, what wait does, a second, what does wait the war a, wait, wait a second, wait a second. If, <laughs> look, if you ask the question which I'm trying to answer, that means that you don't know what I'm telling you now. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, when we, we said, okay, you said this is political commitment. Let's make it, let's make it a legal uh, uh, commitment. Let's put all these principles in a legally binding treaty, indivisible security. You know what they told us? They said, you know, uh, legally binding inside NATO. Just looking, in, we told them, look, President Obama signed this particular paper. Well, this is political commitment, forget about this. And then uh, there was another legally 
binding commitment, uh, I mean uh, the resolution of the Security Council which endorsed the Minsk agreements. It was uh, very, very astonishing that all those who signed the Minsk agreements, except Putin, publicly admitted that they never intended to implement this particular Security Council resolution. So, uh, not, no delivery on the oral commitments, no delivery on written commitments, no delivery on legally binding commitments. And all this was accompanied by NATO instructors beefing up Ukrainian army, uh, Ukraine getting more and more weapons, as uh, Merkel, Hollande, Poroshenko and Zelensky said, we needed the Minsk agreements to buy some time to get more and more weapons to Ukraine. And uh, if you can check the reports of OSC special monitoring mission, they registered sharp increase uh, of the shelling of Donbass uh, just in the beginning of February. 20, 30 times more than the routine exchange of fire uh, before that. So we, we defended our security, we defended the people, the Russian people, who had been denied by Poroshenko and Zelensky, uh, denied uh, the right to use the Russian language in education, in media, in culture, in everything. If you check the Ukrainian legislation passed after the coup uh, brought to power this neo-nazist regime, they cancelled legally, cancelled everything what, what has to do with the Russian language. And when the people who did not accept the coup in the east of Ukraine and in Crimea said, guys, leave us alone, we are not going to, to follow your, uh, your policies, they were declared terrorists. And it is the regime who started the war against these people. That's why the Minsk agreements were uh, considered, you know, uh, the way to stop this. And it was not very difficult to implement the Minsk agreements. It was about the special status for a small part of the east of Ukraine, much smaller than the territory which is controlled by the Russian army now, much smaller. <clears throat> but they didn't want to do this because the special status to be given to this, to this small territory included the right to use the Russian language. And this in itself was considered a taboo by the nazists who took the power in Ukraine uh, through a coup. Then there was the right to have some uh, local police, which is nothing uh, unusual, uh, and then the right to be consulted when judges and uh, uh, prosecutors are appointed for this particular region. By the way, this is exactly, almost, almost the same status as was promised to Kosovo Serbs in 2013, a year before, two years before the Minsk agreements, uh, this community of Serbian municipalities of Kosovo. The same stuff and the same trick. Cheating on Serbia in case of a community of Serbian municipality of Kosovo, cheating on Russia, in the case of the Minsk Agreement. Special status for the Serbs in Kosovo, special status for Russians in Ukraine. In both cases, it was the European Union in the person of uh, Germany and France, uh, and also the high representative uh, regarding the Kosovo deal. And they, I am, I am convinced that just like they admitted that they did not intend to implement the Minsk agreements, they never intended to implement the uh, thing they promised the Serbs in Kosovo. Uh, but I the war, th I, I this, think I this, stop this here. military campaign, or whatever you call it, a war or enduring freedom operation, whatever name you may choose to call it, the bombing campaigns do not alter hearts and minds. They're the worst way to do it. In fact, they freeze people into positions, make further May negotiations I, even okay, more difficult. Okay, 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 so okay. where does this take us? Yeah. Yeah, tell me, tell me uh, when this uh, conference started, what year? Uh, this is the eighth, you know, eighth, eighth, one, eighth Reisner Dialogue we are having. Eighth year? Eighth, so yeah. You started in 2014 or something? Yeah, some, yeah. 
have you been interested uh, during these years uh, what is going on in Iraq, what is going on in Afghanistan? Have you been asking the United States and NATO whether they are, uh, whether they are uh, certain of what they are doing? When, when are they uh, now uh, Schultz, uh, um, Baerbock, uh, Macron and others say this is the first time when the OSC Helsinki final act is being violated. They don't remember about 1999 when Serbia was bombed, when, when uh, Joe Biden, Joe Biden uh, being a senator at that time, uh, he was bragging that I, one year before the uh, bombing of Serbia, I uh, promoted this approach, and I believe that we have to bomb them out into peace. Uh, when when uh, Iraq was ruined as a state, uh, after Colin Powell showed a vial with some powder, and then a few years later Tony Blair said, yes, it was a mistake, what to do? No, but that is a lesson uh, which needs to learn. Wait a second, you, if you believe that the United States has the right to declare a threat to its national interest any place on earth like they did in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, in Libya, in Syria, 10,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean and they have the right to do so and you don't ask them any questions and Russia, not just overnight like they did in Iraq and uh, elsewhere, but for more than 10 years, warning them, guys, you are doing something which is going to be very bad. But I think and the question not, has not, been asked. One second, one second. Not across the ocean, but just on our borders, on the territories where the Russians lived for centuries and centuries and centuries. So, if it is not a double standard, then uh, I am not a minister, you know. The question has been asked, and I, I, the, the experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, everywhere has been that it does not make sense to get into these long protracted wars to defend these kinds of interests. US did not succeed. Why do you think Russia will succeed? Uh, well, I, you, being, you being the head of such distinguished audience, I, I fail to understand why you don't understand. It is no, we are, once, my once, simple once question again, is, it is it what, is, what is the end game? It is the war against everything Russian in Ukraine. Can you imagine that, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for example, in Ireland, they cancel the English language, or in Belgium, they cancel French, or in Switzerland, they cancel German, Can you, or in uh, Finland, they cancel Swedish. Can you even imagine this? Of course not, but nobody lifted a finger, not the small one, not the mid, uh, middle one, uh, when, 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 the Russian, when the Russian language was totally cancelled in Ukraine. We have been knocking on all these doors, OSC, Council of Europe, guys, why don't you say something? Why don't you tell them to behave? And uh, during all these eight years, I don't, I don't recall that your conference was addressing this problem. Hmm. See, the, the question everyone asks here, and that is uh, that's what comes from the other side is, oh, the, the end to the war is simple, if Russia stops fighting, the war ends. And then perhaps there can be negotiations. Is there some end game which you are playing or the other side is playing? Where does this all take us? See, countries in the region are aghast at what is happening. They're affected by what is happening. Food, fertilizer, countries, energy. Countries of the region are affected not by what we are doing in Ukraine. They are affected by the reaction of the West to what we are doing in Ukraine after we had, after we had warned them for, for decades, you know, that they should stop this uh, expansion of NATO and uh, pushing arms into Ukraine uh, to prepare them for, for the war against us. Uh, I just uh, participated yesterday in the G20 ministerial and uh, our Western friends were shouting 
in the microphones, Russia must, Russia must, Russia must, and all the developing uh, delegates, uh, they were also saying, you know, we want to stop the war when Russia is ready to negotiate. Um, if, you, if you are really interested in politics and in the root causes of this particular situation, then you would know uh, that Biden, Blinken, Stoltenberg, Barrell, uh, repeatedly stated that Russia must be defeated on the battlefield. Russia must suffer strategic defeat. Uh, and this, they say, is existential for the West in the context of global domination. It's a very blunt admittance, I would say. So both sides, and, to, and the way I look at it. One second, one second, one yeah. second. And, uh, and uh, the entire G20 was only about uh, what to do with Ukraine and the final declaration, can we have it or not. I asked the Indian friends and the Indonesian friends who were cheering the G20 and those who were cheering G20 before Indonesia for all these long years, whether G20 ever reflected in those declarations situation in Iraq, in Libya, in Afghanistan, or in Yugoslavia, because G20 was uh, formed in 1999 at the level of uh, ministers of finance and central bank uh, directors. And in 2008, it became uh, summit G20. Nobody was giving a damn about anything except finances and macroeconomic policies, which G20 was uh, formed for. These days, when it is not, when it is not something which the West is doing, believing this, uh, that it is its right, when Russia has, after many years of warnings, started to defend itself, there is nothing uh, except Ukraine which is of interest for G20. It's, it's a shame. It's a shame and uh, this policy would fail. If they say this is existential for them, it is existential for us. But there are lots of other countries out there who want peace, who want this war to end, and they would like somewhere a line to be drawn and negotiations to start. Now, what is the end game? Where do you see this? See, this war cannot you, go on forever. You, you we don't be, be stuck here for 20 years you and would repeat, be, a, repeat Afghanistan all over again. You would be ideal a propagandist uh, of the Soviet Union style, you know. Uh, Thank you. Calling, calling for peace, calling against the war. Uh, I am trying to explain to you that it is not black and white, that the sufferings of others are not related to what we are doing in Ukraine to defend ourselves at all. These sufferings are related to the sanctions, to the policy of blackmail, the policy of diktat, which the West is promoting. You know that uh, all of them, uh, Blinken, uh, Stoltenberg, Barrell, uh, ministers of uh, European countries, they travel all over the globe uh, and tell the countries to behave. Join sanctions, vote the way we tell you, and so on and so forth. If they are such big Democrats, uh, I mean, they should respect the right of other countries to take their own positions. Putin explained in great detail before we started this operation why we are doing this, why we didn't have any other choice. The West condemned. Treat others as grown-ups, as mature people. Don't tell them what position to take. The developing world basically was silent until the West started uh, blackmailing them, threatening them, sanctioning those who, who would not sanction Russia. You know what many, many friends of, me, of my, uh, mine in the developing world, they're telling me uh, how this is being done. Uh, when the West says, the Americans tell them, uh, you must vote this way uh, or else. And they say, okay, I, I will vote the way you want me because I believe this can be explained by the United Nations Charter and so on and so forth. But what do I get in return? And the answer from the Americans is you would not be punished. 
fair deal, very fair deal. Then uh, I have quite a number of friends in New York, and when I was there for the last General Assembly, I talked to them, uh, and they were uh, many, if not most of them, were saying that they fully understand what is going on, and that uh, we should not be angry uh, at the way they vote. Uh, and they told me what arguments the Americans have been using uh, when they persuaded people to vote in the General Assembly against Russia. The arguments were very straight. Don't forget that you have a bank account and such and such bank, and don't forget that your kids uh, go to Stanford, bluntly. And I'm sure that there are many people uh, in this room who know that this is true. So, Minister, we're uh, we running out of time, so just uh, a last thing before I pass on for two quick questions from the audience. See, I agree that smart bombs don't exist, smart sanctions don't exist. No matter how, how, how much bombing you do, nothing is going to work out. You are going to cause damage, you are taking innocent lives all along. Similarly, smart sanctions, I agree with you, don't exist. They, they will always be possibilities. Collateral damage is extremely high. So there, yes, both sides need to get together and find a solution. Uh, so. But the point is that somewhere there has to be a line drawn to, okay, let diplomacy have a chance. Let's start talking once again. Look, you, 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 no, but I'll, I'll, you I'll really surprised me. The question <laughs> My dear friend, you surprised me because if you raise this issue, yeah. you should have uh, done some homework. Do you, know, do you know that Zelensky, everybody is asking when Russia is ready to negotiate, when Russia is ready to negotiate, the West continuously is saying that it is not time to negotiate yet because Ukraine must win in the battlefield before any negotiations. And Zelensky himself, uh, nobody calls on Zelensky asking him when he is going to negotiate, but you should have known, preparing for this topic at this meeting, that in September last year, Zelensky signed a decree making it a criminal offense to negotiate with Russia as long as Putin is president. So can you, can you address this issue? Can you invite him and uh, ask him what he is doing? Uh, can I pa take two quick questions from uh, our Aisana young fellows? I'm sorry we are out of time. He is our man. He is from Russia. <laughs> what did he say? Sorry, uh, you'll have to come to a mic. Yes. Raisana yes. young fellows, oh, please yes. sit down. Please sit down. I've not taken a question. Why not? I have the first question goes to Raisna Young Fellows. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm Josuke Hanada, Raisna Young Fellow. Speak my, louder. Yes, my question is about the Sino-Russia relations and its impact on the India-Russia relations because India is now facing the China's assertive challenges in its Himalayan border and the Indian Ocean region. So from last year, there's a dramatic change in the Russia-China relations. There's many joint exercises around Japan, around India. So how does Russia calculate the strategic cost and benefit of deepening its relationship with China, especially its impact on Russia-India relations? Thank you. Well, we never, we never uh, make friends against somebody. Uh, we have excellent relations with China and excellent relations with India. Uh, the relations with India are characterized in the official documents signed by the two leaders uh, as especially privileged strategic partnership. I don't uh, know whether any other country has the same status uh, on paper, officially, uh, with uh, our Indian friends, uh, but this is what we believe uh, is reflecting the reality be it economy, be it technology, be it military cooperation, military technical cooperation, culture, humanitarian ties, educational ties, uh, and we have uh, relations with China that, uh, you know, uh, they never been uh, that good in, from the very beginning of, of uh, the existence of, of China. And we are interested in these two great nations to be friends, and we are trying to be helpful. It was uh, at the initiative of my great predecessor, uh, Evgeny Primakov, that uh, RIC was created, Russia, India, China, Troika. 
he initiated this and this was the beginning of the process which eventually culminated in uh, BRICS formation and now BRICS is uh, uh, very popular among uh, about two dozen countries who would like to join uh, so but the uh, momentum was ensured uh, by the decision to create this Troika Russia, India, China and uh, you might not hear about this uh, as much as of BRICS but this Troika continues to function we met last year and we are going to meet this year again at the ministerial level I think it would be 21st or 22nd meeting already uh, experts in economy, in trade and technology also meet uh, think tanks people meet regularly uh, they were supposed to meet actually sometimes this, this spring but then uh, our Indian colleagues uh, asked for some postponement my, my feeling is the, the, the more they meet the better and uh, RIC is a platform uh, for India and China in our presence uh, because they might not uh, feel themsel themselves comfortable uh, being one-on-one -on -one all the time uh, you know to find some additional common grounds BRICS is another, another, pl another platform and of course we strongly supported uh, India joining uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization including from the, from the uh, point of view of uh, providing another, another place where India and China uh, can, can uh, cooperate together and can uh, look for some common solutions. So, and we, can, we will continue this policy. We never, we never uh, engage in uh, playing uh, any country against uh, any other country. And this is, unfortunately, uh, what is being tried by some other uh, outside players uh, in the context of so-called Indo-Pacific strategies, in the context of AUKUS, in the context of uh, using Quad, not for economic purposes, but trying to militarize Quad. Uh, the idea promoted by our American friends of ASEAN plus Quad is openly aimed uh, at ruining East Asia summits. In other words, it would be East Asia summits minus China and minus Russia. These are the questions which I believe you should address uh, more openly and honestly. Those are the, the risks created for this region. R Russia would always be in favor of bringing people together like we do in uh, many other countries. Uh, second question over there. Uh, Minister, my right. question is very simple. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Bridula and I'm from India, another young Raisin, a young fellow. Just a related question on how the war has affected Russia's strategy on energy and will it mark a pivot towards Asia? And if it does, what is the how is India going to feature in it? Can you, can, can you repeat this? The what, acoustics how, the, how has the war in Russia, how has this war affected uh, Russia's energy interests? Is energy. It, energy. Energy. Is it pivoting towards Asia? And is it uh, the deepening relationship uh, about you know, gas into India and all that she's asking about? You know, uh, the war uh, which uh, we are trying to stop and which was launched against us using the Ukraine, <laughs> Ukrainian people, uh, of course, it influenced, influenced, influenced uh, the uh, policy of Russia, including energy policy. Uh, and the blunt way to describe what is the change, what, what, what changed, we would not anymore rely on any partners in the West. We would not allow them uh, to blow the pipelines again. By the way, we asked for investigation, uh, and immediately this investigation request was denied. The Americans called it a nonsense, uh, and when uh, Seymour Hirsch published his findings, uh, you saw what the reaction of uh, Europeans uh, and the Americans uh, was. Uh, Germany was humiliated 
and physically and morally and uh, in any other way. Everything which is happening now is to reduce Europe to subordinate player for the United States, uh, to undercut European competitive edge, uh, and of course uh, to ruin the uh, economic link between Russia and European Union. This is very obvious. So be it. If this is, if this is the choice of, of them, uh, which fits, by the way, in the uh, rhetoric, in the narrative that what is going on is existential for the West from the point of view of it, it, its ability to dominate. And everything fits into place. Thank and, you, thank and, you, Minister. And the, the, the energy policy of Russia will be oriented uh, towards reliable partners, credible partners. India and China are certainly among them. Thank you so much, Minister. It was uh, great talking to you. Uh, a pleasure having you here in Raisana. I hope next time we meet in Raisana, we meet in less contentious times. Are we going to promise that? Come. Well, the Americans would certainly suggest some questions which you can use. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, please, do, please thank the panelists for their interventions this afternoon. And we will now move to our lunch sessions. Uh, there is lunch outside at Rani Bagh at a buffet counter in the lawns. There are other invitations for lunches for others who have them. Please follow us to the lunch rooms.